again. I'm David, and some people know me from the IRC. I'm known as Kuchen, or sometimes pronounced as Kutchen. That's why I put this <laughs> pronunciation on the slide. Um, and today I'm going to talk about a intermediate language that is used by GHC to compile Haskell programs. And the history of this is basically some guy on the internet said, again, like, yeah, functional languages are not what computers run. They like imperative languages. And this functional stuff, it's kind of black magic. And you know, it maps to something. And nah, it's not really computer -aids. Um So yeah, I didn't like that. But I also didn't have a good counter argument. So I set out to, once again, pick up some Peyton Jones paper from 1992 which gives the, the details of the STG, which is the spineless tagless G machine, which is the uh, low level representation in GHC via which um, assembly is created. Um, yeah, so I read this paper and I thought, well, this is pretty well written and I can probably implement this in like an afternoon. And it turned out it's not so fast, it's still well written, but I just underestimated the task and the bookkeeping necessary to do all this thing, all these things. But for the last couple of months, I wrote a implementation of the STG, an interpreter, not a backend or a compiler. Just something so, as a human reader, it's nice to step through a program uh, and basically watch the low-level version of Haskell execute and learn a lot about the uh, laziness and you know why things land on the heap, how what, what is a stack? Like sometimes people say, well, GHC doesn't have a call stack, and everybody goes like, whoa, compile it without a stack. No, it's a, a different kind of stack, and yeah, and all these things are kind of nice to, to visualize, and yeah, and uh, what we're gonna do is, um, first of all, I'm gonna introduce the, the language and give a couple of translations and Haskell snippets and analogons and STG. And after that, we're going to step through a couple of beginner programs, such as um, a Boolean operation, for example, which is like a 20-step operation until you reach like a, a Boolean result. And watch what happens on the stack on the heap. And depending on the time, we can escalate it a little bit and do like things like a fold L plus of a list and see whether it's the heap or the stack that overflows and how. And maybe we'll also see the naive quicksort inspired algorithm to sort lists and see how inefficient quicksort can be. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm going to start out with um, just a little program. We've got the main function and two innocent little integers, and a plus b is a built in. And we compile this, and yeah, the question is what's going to happen? And I'm going to give a short overview of the, the compilation pipeline just to like pin our location for this talk down. So maybe you can't quite read this, but it's not the point to read this. It's just like to give a general idea about where we are. So up above here, we have the source code. And we parse the source code. We rename it. And at this point, you may have heard of the intermediate language called core, which is what people usually write blog posts about. Core is like a desugared Haskell, so you don't have do notation anymore. It's desugared to binds. You don't have nested pattern matching. So if you have a case of just of uh, um, an alternative, just of a tuple, that's desugared to a case of a case that um, points down into the, the cases. And all the nice things are basically already gone, but it's still a, a typed but very minimal functional language. And you can do a lot of useful things in there, for example, um, the simplifier is this loop here, so you know, bad code goes in and it loops and imp imp uh, improves it. Uh, then it gets tidied up. We generate an interface file to get like the type signatures for linking and you know, foreign library, uh, different library uses. And the actual code is here. It's converted to STG. And well, I think the rest we cannot see right now because of. Let me see whether that works. Is that better? Not really. OK, anyway. So <laughs> down here, after we've done all the things that most people care about in Haskell, which is type checking, safety, and all these things, we convert to STG. And STG is still a clearly functional language, but it has the speciality that it also has a very precise mapping onto real hardware. So we, we're going to be talking about a stack and a heap and memory addresses and you know loading stuff 
Whereas in Haskell, I'm not sure whether the report actually mentions a heap. So strictly speaking, I think Haskell doesn't really have a heap. I mean, if you find a way to use a goat to implement your Haskell and compiler, you're allowed to do this. But usually people tend to not do that. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then below, this is the code generation. After that, we get basically C minus minus and then assembly. So we're going to be at the top level of this um, STG part here, which is we're not going to generate code, but we're going to generate STG code and run that or interpret that. Uh, let me full screen again. This is not supposed to happen. OK, better. Uh, it's a slight problem with the, the projector resolution, so the bottom is cut off. So that's why the asymmetry. Um, yeah, so the example I gave before is this print x plus y, which is obviously 3, but let's pretend we don't know that. And this translates to something that you may still be able to read, but it's much more verbose. You see here a couple of new syntactic forms here. This x, for example, here. Uh, it's a top level, it's called a closure because all the functions and closures there are represented alike, so we don't distinguish between a lambda and a closure, it's just all the closures. Just a lambda is sometimes a closure that doesn't have any free arguments. Uh, what you see here is a lambda parameter, like a lambda sign, just like in Haskell. And after that, the list of parameters, and since x up here doesn't have any, this list is just empty. And this maps to the boxed int of 1. If you've heard about boxing, that's like this constructor thing. And below here, we have the addition function, which is a verbose way of unpacking the x. And you get an int hash of x prime. And this x prime is now a primitive int. And you can add them up again. And yeah, you can roughly see like where the addition comes from. Um, but there are also simpler examples that are easy to explain. For example, if you take the repeat function, which probably everybody knows it's from the standard preload. It takes an element and gives you the infinite list of that element just over and over again. And in STG, you'd write it like, like this. So it's, I guess, still readable if you're used to Haskell, but it's a little bit more verbose. So we see it still takes a, an argument, but we can't write it on the left side of the equal sign because that's basically convenience for the programmer. Uh, we map the x to uh, let to rec which is the same thing as a let. So it introduces a new binding in Haskell. It's called let rec because there's also let, which is non-recursive for the people who know SML, maybe. Um, but it's not really important right now. And this XS is defined to be, again, a lambda or a closure that maps to cons x to itself. So this kind of ties the knot so you get the infinite infinity. But what you'll notice is you have this, these two arguments here in parentheses. And what this is is actually uh, the list of three variables in the closure. So it's not like in Haskell, like you automatically have everything in scope from your parent scopes. Um, in STG, this is explicit um, for different technical reasons. For example, it's much easier to decide what is actually in scope because all that is in scope is what you have in your free argument list and top level closures. And it's much easier to implement, for example, garbage collection if you have that kind of information. Well, and the in part is really the same thing. And I'll give you a couple of more, more comparisons. So here you have the standard implementation of the map function. And again, a slightly more verbose version of that below here. So you take an f in a list, and you see up here you pattern match on the list. And you can't do pattern matching on values directly. But what you do is you scrutinize them, which means you put them into a case. And case is the thing that actually does funk evaluation in the STG. So this case forces the list to weak at normal form. By the way, this is different from Haskell, where case is not, not necessarily strict. So if you case something and then never demand the result, you're never going to force the case, uh, the, the scrutiny. Whereas in STG, case unconditionally forces its argument to weak at normal form and then continues. Um, yeah, and then we do pattern matching, as, you, as you're familiar with. It's just that the empty list is called nil and cons because I didn't put in any you know, operator handling. And also, the, the real STG is um, all prefix notation. 
Um, OK, and then we have this call, which translates to that block below here. That's a lot more verbose. And why is that? Well, the thing is, functions, ironically, in STG cannot take functions as arguments. So you cannot nest functions. What you can do is functions always take, as arguments, take atoms. And an atom is either a variable, which is somehow a, a pointer to the heap, or a primitive value, like an unboxed int. And the reason for this is that up here, you see, um, this doesn't really get called by map. What this creates is a new thunk on the heap, which is you know do f of x. And when you finally demand the value of f and a, f of x, then it's going to force that thunk and update the uh, the value in place. And this is all made explicit down here. So we allocate f x, which is the value f applied to x. But we don't force it. We just put it down here in the const cell. And likewise for the recursive call to map. And one other thing you may notice is we have this double arrow here. Um, this is uh, known as the, uh, I, I used this to represent the update flag. And what this does is um, you can mark a closure that evaluates to a value as updatable or non-updatable. And updatable means that once you have forced this closure to weak at normal form, for example, if you found out the int value, the actual int value, um, and the closure is sufficiently hard to calculate. It may be useful to not recalculate it again, but um, just overwrite the former closure with the result that it evaluates to. So this is how laziness is implemented. You basically say, yeah, I'm, I don't want to do this twice. I already know the answer. We're immutable, so might as well secretly um, update memory. So yeah, we're now mutable, but not observably mutable from the outside program, because we only substitute things with their normal forms, so we get normal forms. Yeah, and uh, the final result here, uh, example here is our favorite quick sorty function, which uses quite a lot of syntax sugar. So we see here we pattern match on a tuple in the let. In STG, you can't pattern match on in let. All you can do is introduce bindings. Pattern matching is purely what case does. Let does only new bindings on the heap. Then you have a section here. We don't have sections. We don't have infix operator in the first place. So um, all this gets expanded and um, already uh, gets more complicated in the translation to core and then to SDG. It's another step. And this becomes this uh, slightly involved mess down here that I'm not going to go through. But you can see kind of like a correspondence. You know, um, We have this less or equal than pivot here which is this function. So you can see this leak pivot closes over the pivot, or takes in the free variable pivot, and takes another argument, which is the anonymous thing we don't see over here. And it goes on like this. It calls partition, then pattern matches on the result of the partition, and recursively calls, you know, when it goes through the stack. And this is just all to introduce you a little bit to like the way these programs look like. And, but maybe it's not a good good idea to write this yourself. So it's probably a good good thing that it's only a, an intermediate language. Worst thing, to be honest, is that it's untyped. So I wrote all of these programs by hand and like a prelude and stuff. And the type errors are just nasty. It's just kind of a little bit like uh, JavaScript with strange syntax. And I don't have a debugger, so my debugger is literally running the program until my machine tells me, nope, not not going on. <laughs> So yeah, it's, uh, careful reading is the, the main debugging tool. Anyway, but um, all you've seen so far is probably it. So the, the SDG language is even smaller than core. And up to the update flag, it doesn't offer much new information. So what you have is function application, like f uh, map applied to fxs. You have evaluation and branching put together in case. So what case does is evaluate to weak at normal form and then react on the result that you got, picking the right alternative. You have what I call definition in the slide. So let is responsible for heap allocations and introducing new bindings. Lambdas are lambdas. And primitive operations on not closures, but primitive entities. And the only primitives we have are integers. Yes? Examples on the right are classical, not STG, right? Ah, uh, that is STG. But, and so case can do a, a functional application in the case because there's case of, of FX. Yes. Uh, well, there's no other thing that can do this. 
function application cannot be nested, but case takes a real expression, and the evaluation rule for case is, well, jump to the evaluation of this expression and remember where the alternatives are stored, and so you can jump back. So yeah, case can take arbitrary expressions, but arbitrary expressions are kind of all you see on this slide. So I mean, this is the expression language we have. So yes. Um, so here's a list of things that are not in STG, just to motivate um, why you would not want to <laughs> do this in production. So types, it's, it's really terrible. Like I've had so many singleton lists called Y, and I should have matched on cons Y nil, but I couldn't, or I didn't, and the machine just halts and says no, because there, there's no rule that applies. You don't have nested patterns, so you have to manually you know, split up the case and nested things, which is especially bad if you want to code fall-through patterns, where you may you know, branch to a much higher pattern matching case up again. You don't have guards. You have, instead, you have if, except for instead of if, you have pattern matching on booleans. You don't have where. Where is kind of the same thing as let, so there's that. Classes are you know, type things, so you don't have them. They all get resolved to explicit dictionary calls. If and else, I said that already, it's case matching on Booleans. Instances are for classes, which are types, so we don't have that. Deriving, uh, well, what do you derive? Classes, don't have classes, don't derive. And list comprehensions are also just sugar for basically fold build expressions. And probably a lot more. Basically, think of something convenient, it's on there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's strictly an intermediate language. With some practice, you can actually write it without many mistakes, but it's tedious and you wouldn't want to actually like write a web framework in it. Um, okay, so that's the introduction. Uh, I'm, now I'm going to pick a couple of really small programs, and we're going to step by step talk about the evaluation of the programs. Because until now, I only talked about um, well, the syntax and how a program looks like, which doesn't really help understanding, to be honest. It's just to, to give you a gut feeling like this could look oh, looks a little bit like Haskell, and I, I could probably read this. So here I prepared a number of programs that we can just step through. And well, this is a cutoff again. Well, this slide is. Luckily not. Oh, oh, that is what I wanted. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is the program I prepared, and what this does is uh, calculates the um, function p implies q, which is here implemented as um, not p or q. So you see the, the main closure is updatable, so it's going to be overwritten by the, the end result. It gives me a, a closure not p, which calculates, well, not p, but I have to name every thunk explicitly. And below that, we have the actual computation that we want to do, which is or2, which is the, the binary or, so the pipe pipe, you know, from Haskell, and then not pq. And uh, not, for example, is implemented as lambda x to case x. We don't have lambda case, obviously, because, well, it's convenient. Um, so it matches on the true, and if the true case is reached, we return false, and the other way around on the other branch. And the binary or pattern matches on the first argument. If it's true, we can decide, yeah, the end result is going to be true. Otherwise, we turn the, uh, the second argument. Um, well, P and Q are just constants set to true and false, so we're computing true, uh, false implies true. No, true implies false, and the end result should be false. And we're going to do this in 17 steps, because <laughs> it's a little bit of But yeah, we're going to load this into our machine, and now we see a couple of things that are explicit that you've probably never seen in Haskell. So up here we have the, the code segment, which is kind of the, the current instruction we're evaluating. So if you think in terms of a C debugger or compiler or interpreter, that would be like the, the pointer to the current line, so to speak. Like this is the thing we're going to evaluate next. And in this case, we see, yeah, we're going to evaluate the main closure, which is the, the starting point of a program. 
And basically, the idea behind the program is reduce the main closure to weak head normal form, and that's your result. The stack is empty, and we're going to fill this up in a couple of steps. And then you have the heap, which is a mapping from memory addresses to, um, well, closures. And in front here, you have these uh, markers, and they're not used for evaluation, but they are um, just for your human guidance. Like, this tells you it's a function, where a function is a thunk that takes an argument, uh, a closure that takes an argument. A thunk is basically the, the rubbish bin. Everything that's not a function or a constructor is a thunk. And in this case, we have an updatable thunk. And as you can see, this zero address is the main closure, as you see, can see below here in the global value list. So main points to this value, and this value says calculate or not p and q, and when you're done, update me with uh, the resulting value. And down here we have the, the other functions. So this is not, this is um, the or, and these are the globals that we're implying, e implying each other, implying some, yeah, that thing. Um, okay, and so, what the STG paper basically gives us is a list of 17 to 19 um, transition rules that tells us how to react in such a state and perform a single step. And right now, what we have is a function application of main to, well, no arguments. So it's a, a primitive example of function application. And the rule says, well, if you want to apply the name main, you should look up what ma main means, you know? So what it's going to do is it's going to look in the local variable list. Do I know main? And local say, nope, empty. But the global variable list luckily has a main closure here. And it points to this address. So we're going to say, well, go to that address, basically. And that's the first step. So we're going to transition into the enter state. So nothing else happens if I jump back and forth a bit. It's um, really just loading the memory address. And now we enter that, which means we're going to load this thunk here into the code segment. So it's going to move up, and we're going to start evaluating the main closure. So now we're, we're in this state, and we're evaluating a let. So we need a new rule that tells us, you know, what, what do we do with a let? And let's work as, well, first of all, introduce a new binding for all the things that we're mentioning, and also, well, you have to put the binding somewhere, which is a new heap closure that you allocate. So in the next step, you're going to see we're going to get a local entry here, which is the not p. It gets a new address on the heap, and the heap is going to get a new um, new allocation for this not p closure. And there we have it. It's not p now points to this heap address, and that heap address is a thunk that says not p. Okay, next next step. We have the or2 applied to something, and we've seen this already. This is a function application. And previously, we didn't have any arguments, so we would just you know, go to the address of or2, which in this case is or2 down here, global variable list. It's going to be the address o2. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to enter the o2 address. But we also have the two arguments, and we have to remember them somehow. And it's the same thing as in other languages. We just put them on the stack. But our stack has different entries, so we put them on the stack as what's called an argument frame. Um, and these are going to be the, the two arguments here. So enter is now the O2, which was the um, OR. And we have the O5 and O4 on the stack. And O5 and O4, we can see down here, are the Q from before. And the O5 is the thunk of not P that we've created before. Um, as you can see, we've lost a couple of names and replace them with memory addresses. So this is a common scheme. Like, If you don't need the name anymore, it's just going to be gone somehow, which makes it a little tedious to follow at times. Um, yeah, it's a low level thing. So I guess it's the price you have to pay for looking at this. But still, you can see the transitional steps you have to take. And anyway, now we're entering the O2. O2 says, says, hey, I'm a function. I need two arguments. So if you want to load me, you better give me two. And luckily, we have two arguments here. So what's going to happen is we load this function here into the code segment, or the function's body. And we're going to create bindings for x and y based on these argument frames. So that's what we get. 
x and y get bound to those two memory addresses, and we load the, the content of the lambda, or the closure. And yeah, now it's the first time we have a case evaluation. So the case rule is, first of all, next thing you're going to do is evaluate the scrutiny. And also, in order to know where to jump back or to continue once you're done evaluating, um, we're going to have to push a new kind of frame onto the, the stack, which is called a return frame, which holds two things. One, the, the list of alternatives, and also the um, local environment to restore it later. So next thing is going to be evil x and a new return frame. So there we go. And yeah, so the return frame lists the alternatives and the former local environment. And you can see we had the x in the local environment before, but it was dropped here because it doesn't appear at all in this um, in the body of the lambda and the body of the um, alternatives. So we can just discard it, and garbage collection can maybe clean it up earlier. Actually, this was a bug in the interpreter, and yeah. No, it's not anymore. Um, OK, evil x. x is the address 05, as you can see here. 05 is the not p. So now we're jumping into the not p part of the not p or q that we, we try to evaluate initially. And it's a function application again. So we enter the 05. We have entered 05, and it turns out it's another function. So we have to enter again, push the p into the stack. Um, oh, yeah, garbage collection. Sorry. Um, so now we lost all references to this 05 thing if I jump back and forth. 05 just doesn't appear anymore, so garbage collection can just discard it. I basically put GC in just if I had longer programs, it would, the heap would just grow, and it was unreadable. It's not necessarily a performance thing here. but. OK, now we have function application again. So we're trying to evaluate the knot. We load a case match on the argument of the knot here. Um, evaluating the scrutiny. We're entering the scrutiny. And we found out, finally, we have something in weak at normal form. So we can finally return from a case. And if we evaluate a data constructor, that just puts us into the return state, state, <laughs> a return con state which is what's going to happen next. And it's applied to no arguments. And I should have deleted those parentheses, but I forgot. So it's true with no constructor arguments. And when you evaluate a return con, next thing is you're going to try to pop a return frame. And based on that, decide where to continue. And it's maybe a bit misleading to call it a return frame, because it sounds like C's return a little bit. But it's not that you're actually jumping back where you came from, but you're jumping to where you're going to continue. So you don't do this jump back and then maybe branch off again. You're going to do a direct jump. And I've seen examples where this is really beneficial to, um, to performance. I think somebody in IRC posted a, um, a really simple sieve of uh, Eratosthenes and compared a naive or semi-naive low-level Haskell implementation with a C implementation. And because this jump is missing, it had a really, really nice performance. That's just a tangent. OK, so we return true. The true branch gives us a false. So we're going to load the false up here. Evil false is, well, transition into the return con state. Return con says, oh, I need to return. Better pick a branch. It sees, oh, I'm in the false branch, so I'm going to load the y here. So it's going to take this branch and evaluate the y. The y, as you may remember, was the um, second argument of the, um, of the or that we were initially trying to calculate. So we're entering the 4. 4 is a false, because we're trying to compute True implies false, so that's this false. We return false, and now what you'll notice is we're trying to return, but we don't have uh, a return frame. So the machine doesn't know where to return. But what it does know that is that there is an update frame in the way. And I skipped over this in the beginning, but the main closure was updatable in the beginning. 
And so what happens when you enter an updatable closure is, first of all, you erase it from the heap and you overwrite it with a black hole. So there are no references left. Garbage collection can just ignore whatever was there. And a black hole says, I'm currently in evaluation, but the program is going to update me later, which is precisely what happens here. We have this false, and we have this update frame here pointing to this address. And this tells the machine to take this false and just overwrite that part in memory with the false. So yeah, this is where we finally see, see laziness in action. Um, maybe you've seen black holes in GHC when you got this error that used to be called loop. It was a uh, loop in, um, in brackets, uh, angle brackets, which is when you enter a black hole again, because that means a thunk that is currently being evaluated and is trying to enter itself again, which means you have a definite infinite loop. And the compiler can detect that sort of non-termination and, well, abort. OK, so in this step, we see the black hole is overwritten by a constructor that takes no arguments and is just the false. And now we don't have anything more to do. And we transition to a terminal state because there's nothing else to do. And since the stack is empty, we probably finished correctly. If the stack wasn't empty, that would have meant, yeah, we forgot doing something and the machine halted prematurely. So yeah, this is probably the, the simplest example you can, you can give, the simple, simplest that does something. But you can already see most of the rules. Like there are a couple of more, like how to update a closure, like a, a, a function, I mean, and how to deal with primitives. But other than that, this is basically it. And there are not that many prim ops in this implementation. Uh, GHC has a, a huge amount of prim ops for you know I/O and um, array handling and what have you. Um, but the, the main logic, like the the main Haskell thing, you is all there is. What you've seen here, like you have really just pattern matching, allocation, garbage collection cleans up, you pop, you push, and that's it. So this could basically, like if you compile your sort and your website, this is at some point looks like that. And I found that pretty amazing that you can really reduce this to such a small language and then have it compile efficiently. I'm not going to talk about code generation, but um, yeah. So this is what the, uh, the C backend would then evaluate, kind of. OK, um, one thing I could mention is, um, all the, the cases need to have a default case. Because we're untyped, we don't know about constructors. We don't know that true and false are exhaustive. So the STG forces us or could insert a fall through pattern that just says, hey, you know, pattern match failed. Why I did this in this way in all my definitions is it gives me a, a poor man's stack trace. So in case I pattern match on a just here, for example, it's going to give me an error not applied to this bad bool, which is a just. And if you get some really weird errors, you can like follow the heap to where the, the error occurred. I could also just you know return like a constructor called error here or something like that. And the machine would just say, hey, I don't know what to do with an error. I'm going to halt. Uh, OK, so we've seen all the types of frames. Um, yeah, I think we can venture onto some more interesting examples. So let's calculate the length of a list of three elements. Spoiler, it's going to be three. Uh, let me just check the marshalling. OK, cool. Um, here's our program again. This is our length function. We're delegating to a primitive a loop over a primitive int, so it's sufficiently fast. Um, it's kind of what the standard library does, I think. We again have a main closure that is updatable because of the double arrow. It calculates the length of x's. We have the nil, uh, which is the main closure that does nothing but say, hey, I'm the empty list. And this can be shared among all the invocations of, um, of lists, which is a, a nice feature of the STG because it's untyped. You can share all the nil closures. In core, you can't because you have an empty list of type int and you have an empty list of type you know, char or what have you. And in STG, because you erase all the types, you can just have one nothing for the entire program and one nil. Um, yeah, but you have to be really careful not to mess up otherwise. 
And this is access, and it's, it looks horrid. So what it is, is the list of true, false, and true. And while it looks awful, it's probably good that it does, because um, it makes you realize how, how bad of an array or collection data structure a list in Haskell actually is. It's a singly linked list of pointers to pointers to pointers. And it's not really something you want to have as a random access array or even as something to loop over. If you have fusion, it's all right. But without fusion, it's, it's not really a suitable data structure. It's more of a control, control structure. So what does the list look like? Well, we have the zeroth value, which is true. And we have the, the const cell, which is the beginning of the list, which is the zero value. Wait, never mind. It's a pointer. It's going to be a pointer to the zero of the value, which is going to be true, and a pointer to the first cell. And the first cell is going to be this abomination here, which takes two closed-in arguments, like in free, has two free variables, namely the first value, which is false, as you can see here, and a pointer to the second part of the list. So you can explicitly see like how this is going to distribute. And if we look at the, the initial state, and run it for a couple of steps until we actually evaluate this um, this list here and put it on the heap. Um, then we're going to see like what the heap layout of a list uh, actually is. So we do business as usual. We enter, we evaluate the length, we push, and do 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 do. I'll evaluate the length. Bunch of bookkeeping until we finally get far enough so we can see. Okay, now we now we're going to lead the list. So. This also teaches you about laziness, because we always thought laziness, yeah, it's kind of like deferring computations. No, laziness is brutal. It's, it's much, much lazier than I would have ever imagined. It's so reluctant to do any work, it's ridiculous. Like, following the sort example, it's just, you realize, like, whoa, this is laziness. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> you should try it out. It's, I did not expect that to happen. But. Anyway, so now we have a... Uh, Nicely polluted heap here. So we have um, up here is our beginning of the list. The one cons points to the 06 memory address. The 06 memory address is a cons cell which points to the one value and the two or the second cons. And basically, this entire thing, if you stare at it long enough, you're going to see like, you know, this 05 is what the upper zero cell here was. So this is the, the uh, first entry. 06 tells me where to continue. And this goes on to the next part of the list, which is this constructor, which is the two value, and then a nil. And the nil is up here. And then finally, the, the list is kind of done. So lists are distributed all over the heap. And it also means that every time you follow a list in Haskell, you basically get a, a giant cache miss, and you have to look up and it's not really good for performance. So that's why people often say, like, don't use lists. Even if you have to iterate through it like step by step, you're always going to chase pointers and then chase other pointers to get the actual values of the list, like the, the contents, not only the, the continuing. Um, yeah, and we could step through this in detail again, but um, I guess we've seen most things happen. So here we have another case of an update. We return a const cell, but we don't have anything to return to because we have the 03, which is the original list. Because when I go up a bit, you see this thunk that used to be the list this was updatable here. So now that we know what the first element of the list is, we're going to override the, um, where is it? Right. We're going to override the 03 black hole here with this constructor, basically in a little more verbose way. So these are generated variables, but they point to 05 and 06. And if I go back to the previous step, you can see 05 and 06 were these arguments here. Actually, they're still there here. And then we branch, and we cut case a primitive to find the final result. And here you can see this is case doing a strict evaluation. So this is a prim up. We do the primitive plus of n, which is, well, the n is uh, 0 plus one, so we're now calculating zero length of the empty list, plus one for we found one element. And this continues and continues until at some point we're going to see 
we're kind of looping around again, right? So now we're adding one to n, and n is now one. And we continue, basically pattern matching on the rest of the list until we find uh, the nil. Now we have access, it's still a cons. Enter, and evil access again, and this time access is nil. So now we terminate the recursion of the, um, of the length function. We branch out and take our unboxed n, which is down here, and put it into a box. So we get a proper int out. We return it, and now sometimes it aligns just nice, so nothing moves, and you can see the update. So here <laughs> you have that case. Um, here we have the, the update frame, and we write into the 01 address, we write int hash of that variable, and that variable is defined to be 3. Just as a side note, we don't write int hash of 3 hash in here, because that would, well, the short story is that would require code generation at runtime. We can't do this. So we precompile this closure that has an, a hole open, and we fill it with a number. But basically, you could imagine like this is int hash, 3 hash, and it's kind of the same thing. And we terminate again. So we've successfully calculated that the length of true, false, true is 3, which is great. <laughs> hmm? In just 42 steps. In just 42 steps, yeah. Oh, by the way, this is my slide that tells me not to push a 4 like I usually do because I'm not used to the workflow on the presenter. Um, yeah. Oh, and we can even see like in the end down here, there's a computed value, which is the 3 which is a small hack I just put in for the presentation, because otherwise you would have to like look up, oh, what did I want to compute? OK, it's the main function. Main function points to 01, and 01 is this, and this is an int of something, and it's 3. OK, it's 3. So it's much easier to just print like the value taken out. Yeah, this is 3. Don't worry about it. Uh, yeah. So other examples. Um, basically, what I did is just try out really small programs that people on the RC used to have problems with. And they wondered, like, why, why is my heap growing? Like, I have this top-level closure. I'm walking over it once, like the Fibonacci series, for example. I'm printing each element. Why is it, why is it not garbage collected? And the reason is the garbage collector just doesn't track top-level closures, because you know they may at some point be needed again. And all these things are answered if you just write a, a very small STG program carefully. And then you can just step through and see, see all the, the nitty gritty details as if you had sort of a debugger. Um, and it also teaches you that all these steps are really, really simple baby steps. And it's not magic at all. Like you can see each rule, and there are 17 of them. Rule 18 and 19 are optimizations. And you know, that's kind of what you would have in C. In C, you have, well, I have a function with arguments. What do I do? Well, Evaluate the arguments, push them onto the stack, enter the function, and it's just a little bit the other way around. So basically, um, what you've also seen is the difference between laziness and strictness is a really, really small design de decision. Because what we do here in SDG is when we have a function application, we just push the arguments as they are, as you know, pointers to somewhere onto the stack and don't look at them. And then we enter the function, which makes us evaluate the function first until the function says, OK, now I'm going to need two arguments. Whereas in C, you would just do it the other way around. You would just look at the arguments first, evaluate them, and once you know the value, you enter the actual function that you did want to call. So it's kind of like when you read the paper, you realize, like, whoa, this is not unnatural at all. It's like just an arbitrary decision to you know, do the, the strict evaluation. It's really just this tiny, small step that, that gives you laziness, which is Pretty impressive, really. Um, OK, so we have 10 minutes left. Um, I think I'm going to show you the, um, the folding examples, and because those are probably the canonical um, mistakes people do. So this is going to calculate the sum via foldL, which is a favorite overflow in all of Haskell, probably. Um, it's not going to fit on the screen because it's, <laughs> it's going to load, but we're going to be able to see um, 
like a couple of things. So uh, we step through until we have the list. Yeah. But uh, normally the uh, common column, column, uh, dot, dot, uh, the sugars into from num and to uh, num, right? Mm -hmm. Here you have already. Oh, yeah. Um, I have marshalling just because it's really tedious to write a list yourself. Basically, you have to write this horrible indirection thing by hand in order to put a value in or provide like a syntax tree. Or So I wrote a type class that tells me to STG A, which is something you can automatically translate into STG definitions. So what happens here actually is this is still Haskell that expands this. And then Haskell realizes, oh, I need to use the 2STG implementation for lists. So that's basically a small code generation feature. So yeah, this is Haskell. And this is a, something that takes a Haskell list and generates me an, an STG program that I can then load into the machine and evaluate. So this is purely convenience. I didn't have this in the beginning. It's really worth spending the time on, on marshalling. Likewise for the taking values out, because if you have a sorted list, the heap is it's brutal. <laughs> and it's really nice if you have some, some automated bot that just goes through and tells you, like, yeah, that's the list. OK, um, I promised you an awful list, which is nice for you know summing up. So we have this thing. And scrolling down, the heap is kind of all right. But in the next step, we're going to allocate a lot of things. And this is our list on the heap. So it's pointers, a const cell pointing to OXOA and to C and to E. And so it's like this chain of little indirections that goes all the way down here until we finally have a const that ends in nil. Yeah, and we're going to fold over this um, somewhat fast. So I'm <laughs> just going to step over it. But as you may know, I've, I have this on a slide, actually. Uh, fold L. What's going to happen is, let me zoom in a little bit. What's going to happen is we're going to build a, up a thunk in the accumulator, basically walk over the entire list, building up the computation. Well, eventually, you know, here is your sum computation. But until then, we're just going to do like record that it's going to have to be done. Um, and thunks live on the heap. So what this does is just pollute the heap with indirections of this kind of sum here. When fold L terminates, um, we get this huge thunk out, and then we can worry about evaluating it. So yeah, what's worth noting is that fold L cannot actually overflow. Like fold L is just calls itself. I mean, it's it's a tail recursive function. It doesn't build up anything except for a huge thunk elsewhere. So it's not fold L that actually overflows. It's like the thunk that we allocate. And that thunk is on the heap, so we're going to overflow the heap. And um, if I remember correctly, like step 90 is kind of the, one of the worst offenders, right? So here we have our initial list. And down here, we have a lot of thunks that say, evaluate f of the accumulator applied to y. And if you follow these things, f is going to be the addition function. Accumulator is um, a pointer to a previous thunk. So this is the second sum, which points to the first sum, which is here. And it's, again, a long list of things. And we're going to do this 10 times or 11 times for adding 10 numbers and then the final 0. And when we're done, the fold L is going to, here we have a return con of nil. So the fold L is going to terminate because it's, well, it's done. And now we're going to evaluate the accumulator. The accumulator is the very last thing we see down here, which is a function application of a function application of a function application. So what's going to happen now is we're going to stepwise go through all the heap closures. And for each of them, we're going to allocate something on the stack. So instead of the heap, we're going to blow up the stack now. And you see the return frames are kind of pile up because they're like this return to this other sum when you're done. And you know, continue, continue, continue. I don't remember how far this goes. but So we have 31 stack frames for summing up 10 numbers. It's pretty good. OK, I th think we're done now and shrinking again. OK, now it's finally reached the innermost computation. It knows how to add the, the two numbers, so that will be the um, O plus 1 here. 
calculates that, returns, calculates this parentheses, adds parentheses, adds uh, uh, added to two, and just shrink the stack again. And we see the numbers are shrinking, so now we have 15 stack frames. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. And we're already 300 steps in, so it's not terribly efficient. Oh, yeah, and we can already see, like, here we have the final result, 55, already somewhere. And we're going to update two thunks with that, because I don't remember why. One of them is the main. The other one is, I don't know what. Probably the, the result of the folder was somehow updatable. I don't remember. Anyway, constructor application, update, garbage collector, all the rest. Update, and no further, rules apply, and we finally reach our final result, 55 in a huge stack and 55 stack, uh, no, 32 stack frames. Uh, OK, and now for comparison, we could do the same thing for fold R, which is a little more exp efficient in a way because it only overflows the stack, I think. Uh, so it doesn't do the, the whole thing. Hey, I'm going to do a heap overflow and then a stack overflow. It's just going to go in and one thing. <laughs> I guess that counts as uh, efficient <laughs> or more efficient. Um, so this is uh, fold L prime now, which is the proper way of summing up the list. And if we picture this, um, what this does is just once you reach an intermediate result here, this is O plus one, it says, well, I promise I'm going to need this later. Please evaluate it right away and don't do all the bookkeeping because that's the inefficient part. And well, same thing. We load everything onto memory. We go to step 90, which is where the, the stack pollution started in the other example. We continue a little bit and we see the, the stack stays in like a height of three, maybe four or five. I think this may be the maximum. It's three arguments on the stack and then uh, continues down a bit, but we're never going to blow the stack. And because of the missing updates, we're going to be a tiny little bit quicker than the, um, the other case. So now we're not 300 something steps, but 258, but we're also reaching 55. Um, and the heap is well, it was also garbage collected in the other case, I guess. But we never had a long list of thunks down here because we wouldn't ever allocate like this F, X, Y. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of other examples, but they're in their example module, so I didn't intend to show all of this. Um, I can give you like a, just to show you the result, if you do the naive sort of a, um, like this uh, quick sorty like function of some randomly permuted list. And we just jump to the end and see there's a marshalling error, which is because I forgot a. Oops, nope. <laughs> Takes a little bit. So. We took 1,351 steps to sort this list. And the heap is just, so this is the result of our computation here, which is stored on the heap. And if you try to follow this, this is like the original list, but pointed differently, and you just can't see it. So this is why I have this, this extraction thing there. And the program is also a lot longer. So this is our final heap here of all these things, like primitive addition, primitive uh, greater than the partition function and all these things. OK, so we're roughly out of time. So I'm going to shamelessly advertise the project a little bit more. So the goal of this project was really to have this as something you can use yourself and also use for teaching. So it's probably a little condensed in a single talk. But I try to make it in such a way that um, Basically, the, the primary design goal is a good, a bad error message is a bug. So I also have a, a more verbose mode that explains like the steps to you. If I do like the verbose two here, then I get like yeah, you know I enter a non-updatable closure. So I enter, 
at that address and we extend the local environment and it gives a little help text. And there's also a lot of documentation in Haddock and basically it's, it's something you can use to, to learn about the Haskell evaluation model. And there's also a, a number of other example programs like I did this implies thing here and the length. And we also have our friend the Fibonacci zip width solution which is an infinitely running program and because of lazy IO you can actually load this into and step through and in a pager and lots of other programs here and yeah a lot of things that you may recognize from a compiler list, such as garbage collection and marshalling and stuff like that um, oops, wrong slide wrong slide okay so that's it nothing else to continue and it's on the um, on hackage as the STGI project for well STG interpre interpreter and it's on kuchen slash STGI on github and yeah if you want to try it out I'm around please ask me about things if you manage to break it and it's unhelpful please tell me about it because I I know what it's like to not be able to write programs in this because I would just make syntax errors all the time uh, now I don't anymore, so I can't really judge what, what are typical errors people make. Um, but I really want to have good, good messages if you do that, so you can really use it to teach yourself and maybe to teach beginners, like, hey, look, this is why lists are inefficient. This is what happens if you do fold L prime over fold L. Stuff like that. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>
we might try doing something like that. But um, so far, I've seen things that I'd rather work on for making presentation nicer. For example, a web front end would be really nice. So you can see a stack and heap next to each other. And on transitions, you see like a blink, blinking thing. So you see, hey, this changed. Because I mean, the console is, I guess it works, but it's not the, the best user experience, really. And I'm piggybacking on less to like search for equal, equal, equals to have a N button to get to the next step. Um, yeah. So I'm open to it, but I haven't done it yet. Yes? Yes, yeah, so that's what I mentioned to, to Gleb. You can write your own backend or your own interpreter. There's even a project, I think it's called Mini STG, um, which is somewhat similar to this. That's a small STG interpreter. And they do have a backend for, um, for their thing. Um, yeah, but as I mentioned, I, I have so little, so, so little support for primitives that it's basically, um, I don't think there's much to gain from this except problems and throwing lots of error messages like, hey, I don't know how to print. Please do it differently. Um, yeah. What you can do for inspiration is you can compile a normal Haskell program with minus D dump STG, I believe, which is going to give you the actual STG output of GHC that it's going to use to generate. It's full of annotations, so it's really like this is a nice way to show an intermediate language for a compiler. What GHC is going to give you is the full-blown thing that it uses to compile stuff. Um, you can follow this. It's well, it's it's a slow process, but it's definitely doable. And um, you can also have a, a nice look at what GHC does for optimizations. So you can see the difference between the optimized and unoptimized thing. But what I have here is completely independent of GHC, other than you know being compiled with it. <laughs> Sorry, can you speak up? De suppress all. Yeah, drops Yeah, it drops a lot, but uh, yeah, I think I've used this together with core. It drops a lot of annotations, right? Yes, I'm not sure. You get sanitized output. It, it's it's certainly going to help, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't really know the SDG syntax that um, GHC uses to dump. So I designed this myself because the, the paper kind of has a little more noisy syntax with lots of curly braces and stuff like that. So you won't be able to copy paste anything out of GHC into here. Yeah. Um, and GHC obviously has a little expanded um, STG. For example, GHC has three update flags. Um, yeah, let's, we can talk about this later. Um, I'm out of time, as I'm told. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so.